What I'm going to talk to you about is the wish system from the fish perspective and actually from regulatory perspectives. Fish passage has to be and must be safe, timely, efficient, and effective. And that all sounds good, except that nobody really knows what those words mean in real life in terms of how does it apply to fish passage. You know, we've broken it down um, with some agreements, uh, you know, across agencies and what have you, that you know, safe can be looked at in terms of survival, reproduction, injury, behavior, disease transmission. Timely and efficient can be sort of uh, evaluated with respect to volitional entry or selective passage, passage time, ener energy reserves, travel time and distance, and then effectiveness can be you know, considered in terms of allowing migration and homing and, and natural fish response. And then we, we put in there also the durability of the system. We've done a considerable number of studies and we've done it not by ourselves, but in partnership with a large number of folks. And these are just some of them. We have a lot of expertise with respect to engineering and, and other aspects, but all of these folks have expertise with respect to fish and, and, and other places that are, are relevant to the fish passage. And this is just a map of the U.S. showing where some of these studies have taken place. We're going to look at different components from, from different studies and, and how they can be sort of teased out of a study so we can say something about these aspects. We go through a couple of studies that will look at all of the things that are sort of highlighted in white there with sur survival and energy and distance. It was a head-to-head. -head. It was the only time we've had the opportunity to look at whoosh fish passage over a dam versus fish swimming up a ladder. And it, it was a wonderful time to do a head-to-head. -head. And what we found was that the median time that the fish swam up that last bit of the ladder was nearly three hours. But in contrast, the whoosh tube it took really through the tube only about eight seconds and the fish had to recover from anesthesia from the treatment of, of it putting the tag in we had anesthetized the fish so that took about two almost two and a half minutes for that to happen for them to wake up enough for them to go through the tube so you can see we're, look, we're talking about hours versus seconds not even minutes but seconds to, to get to the same place and what that meant in terms of the fish afterwards was significant. And these were significant findings. So that the benefit, it seems, of, of even just saving 15 and a half feet of vertical swim through a ladder was that they had more energy reserves to get upstream farther faster. And that allows them to get to cooler water, potentially getting to spawn, um, spawning habitat and, and being more successful. Of those fish that we just talked about that we let go and move up river, we followed them then to see really the advantage of, of, of saving that energy and how fast they went. And this is just a, a quick series of slides that you should be able to see. The green fish are the whoosh fish and the purple fish are the those that went up the, the ladder. And you can see how they progress much more rapidly and make their way further faster, just to emphasize that point. So all the fish did the entire ladder, but our fish, or the whoosh fish, got a, a little additional whoosh ride. And so the, the point of this study was to show that just because they had this, this little amusement park ride, in a sense, we didn't do anything that would impact their ability to migrate or home or introduce disease issues or what have you. And what we find, is that the groups basically behave the same, which is what we would expect. Going through the whoosh tube had no impact on their survival, their migration time, their passage time, their homing, their disease transmission, or their behavior. They reached each of the dams at about the same percentage of fish and at about the same time. Again, because there were two populations, we had a, maybe not quite a completely equal distribution between the whoosh fish, which were the uh, on the bottom row here, versus the uh, fish that were, uh, did not take the bush 100 foot trip. So that's why the percentages at say Rocky Reach and, and Wells are a little bit different because different populations of fish were going different directions. But at the end dams, like at Zossel there or at, in the Okanagan, you see again, we're seeing the same percentage of survival rates and, and fish detection at all of those locations. So having gone through whoosh, there is, there is zero impact on, on all of these factors. So Vince was saying, um, you know, just to emphasize, this study was, again, a head-to-head -head of fish doing exactly the same thing, both 
all of them, I guess, going over the dam via the ladder. This was not taking a whoosh trip over the dam. It was just taking a whoosh ride and then having to swim up the ladder. We've done now a, a three years running study with salmon. Uh, these are Chinook that swim up the Yakima River. And um, all of the fish at, at Rosa Dam there are brought in off of the ladder and sampled. And a proportion of them are then sent to a hatchery for hatchery purposes and reproduction. So what we had the opportunity to do was take some of those fish and put them through a whoosh tube versus their normal treatment, which is to hand carry them. And in both cases, the fish end up in a truck and then they are trucked to a hatchery where they are put in a, a raceway for a couple of months until they are ready to spawn. And then the purpose of this slide is to show you that it's reproducible and comparative that there is no impact of going through a whoosh tube relative to the standard functions in terms of weight, uh, in terms of adult survival till spawning. The impact of the condition of the year, a very cool year versus extremely hot, hot year, really did impact the survival till spawning. So those couple months in the, in the raceways, they didn't fare very well, say like in 2015, but there wasn't any real significant difference between fish that had gone through the whoosh tube versus um, hand carry. Vince is sort of talking to me and I will uh, re relate. He was saying that it, it would maybe a little bit more of the story is, is the fish that, that, that we moved and that were hand transported went into a, into a hatchery truck that then was trucked for an hour and a half up to the hatchery, and then the fish, again, were in the raceways for several months. And so, you know, there's a lot of different factors that can impact uh, survival, but most of them are, are common. The, the, the significant difference between them was the fact that they traveled through our, our tube or not, but, but no real impact with respect to overall survival. This 2016, we had the opportunity to change it up a little bit in that we didn't just use a 40-foot tube, which was pretty small, but we actually had an 1,100-foot tube as well. And this tube went not just um, 1,100 feet, but it actually went in a, a vertical rise of 100 feet. Because of, again, just the way that it all worked, the 40-foot the fish, the fish that we that were proportion, apportioned to the 40-foot were at the beginning of the run, the 1,100 foot were at the end of the run. So unfortunately, they were usually at the end of the run, they're a little bit more beat up. But basically, the data shows in that regardless of the distance that we were traveling, there was no significant difference in adult survival till spawning, having traveled through the whoosh tube, regardless of length versus hand carry. Most of the studies that we do, you, know, you don't have the opportunity to watch that fish for, for months and months, and it's, it's looking at immediate survival or potentially a short term, 24 hours to a week. And so this is just a summary of not all, but a number of, of the studies that we have done, looking at the different lengths of the whoosh tubes on the far right, uh, the different kinds of species that we have moved, and, and the kinds of percentages of survivals that we have, have obtained. Again, another way of looking at survival is, 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 is actual reproduction and looking at the viability of the eggs. And then out here for salmon, it's, it's look, taking those eggs to the eyed egg stage. And in those previous studies that where I was talking to you about at Rosa, where we kept those adults and then harvested them, we see that the uh, reproducibility of the egg viability is, is very strong across all three years. And it, regardless, again, of, of whether they were in a short tube or not uh, a long tube. Overall, looking at our system, and it looks so high tech and foreign, you know, people really concern themselves with, with injury, and there's lots of different ways of thinking about injury. You know, is, are they gonna lose slime? Are they gonna lose scales? Are they gonna have actual overt injury? Is, is it going to be stressful? Is it going to fish affect the swim behavior? We've had a number of groups, independent parties, uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, Sintef in, New York, in Norway, HDR did a study with Shad in Maine, all of them looking at these various aspects of fish health, basically. And we, they found, all of them concluded that, that going through the whoosh system did not impact the swim, did not, there was no evidence of stress, no evidence of, of damage in any way to the epithelium or the slime or the scales. Fish were not confused. So there are to date no direct associated whoosh passage injuries when the, when the system is fully operational and functional. These are just a little bit of data and I won't go through it particularly in detail here, but 
Uh, the pool and weir the, the, at Mud Mountain is the way the fish just jumped themselves up and then entered. We did have a bar grate that allows only selective entry into that pool, so Chinook couldn't enter, and it allowed just the, the pinks, the smaller salmon, to enter, and we moved approximately 500 fish through that system. Ringgold this last fall was the Alaska Ways Deep Pass. The fish swam up through that and, and then were sorted with the scanning system and moved, if they were the right size, to the, to the pool. We had about 230 of those moved that direction. And the steelhead, that were primarily the smaller ones, were moved into the bypass, which was, and then they were actually returned back to the river. We could actually position ourselves into a place where the fish actually are naturally congregating and the attraction is, is there that's maybe not where you're getting the outflow of, of the dam itself to confuse the fish and that kind of thing. So there's, there's versatility that we have, but our expertise isn't in de designing that entry, but we, we work with other partners in, in trying to adapt to the system and the place. The Cleon project really was going to be a wonderful opportunity for us to look at true volitional entry. They were supposed to be native returning sake that were going to swim up the river. They would have already been pre-pit tagged and um, acoustic tagged, and we could follow them up the river, watch them actually go through the, the steep pass and then through our system and then track them uh, via USGS for several months. Last year there was largely insufficient sockeye um, return such that they only actually released four fish and only one actually made it up to the steep pass and then we were not allowed to actually turn it on. So after that big installation we still wanted to look at you know, the ability to move fish, and so it was modified and we trucked in fish and um, had to hand feed them over the false weir, ultimately, but managed to um, transport, you know, 126 sockeye, 1,700 foot distance. Ultimately, it was about a 180 foot rise because we had to actually go up and over, not just the dam crest, but over the road on the dam. And we, the mean time of those fish traveling was about 57 seconds. So it was the first time that fish have gone over that dam in about 100 years. And so it was a huge, huge feat and a, a wonderful way of proving that we can do all of these things. And we would love to be able to do that ultimately, totally volitionally, but we did not have that opportunity at that site last year. Part of, of our challenge in terms of presenting this to the world is, is we look so high tech and so maybe so shiny that it, it's hard for some folks to put their head around, you know, they think out of water, which I think we've described that we're not completely out of water, but, and we, and we move fish very, very fast, but not too fast because they swim right away afterwards. What looks so high tech and, and shiny and, and it's hard for pe people like to think of fish in water and swimming through a nice little stream. And, and then so that, the, the, you know, there is this sort of grassroots desire to stay in this, this native natural fishways, and there's nothing wrong with those except that sometimes it's not the best solution. But from the fish perspective, they come over this false weir that you can see in this diagram, and then they start to, you know, they get partially dewatered and they're on an angle and they just slide. And in about one and a half to two seconds, they have slid through the scanning hood. They have gone through a sorting gate that they didn't even know was open or closed. They slid into an accelerated, and then they're in the tube and they have not stopped at all. They've just slid. So the amount of time that it takes for you to like accidentally turn off the light and then, then go back and turn it back on, the fish is up and in the tube. And so this is just to show you a number of different uh, species and the number of species in these different studies that we've moved, the different ends, the different tube sizes, distances, heights that we've gone, and how long it's taken us. So 1,700 feet, 57 seconds, but you know, something that's 250 feet, it's, it's 13 seconds in the tube and they're done and they're out. And, 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 the, and the fish move on fine and they're safe and happy. All right, lastly, I think is just to comment on the durability and that's what uh, Jim had talked to a little as well. We have been able to do studies in the range of just above the freezing all the way up to 105 degrees and we do have the ability to, to blow a cool air through there to keep it in the tube, it's not 105 degrees, but it is 105 degrees outside, and we can maintain a, a reasonable temperature for the fish. We have the flexibility of the tube so that there is really no restrictions, but when we're moving them fast, we make sure that we have an arc turn radius, for instance, of, of 10 feet or, or greater, so that we, we aren't going to impinge the fish in any way. 
when you have the opportunity to actually feel the tube and put a little bit of water on it, you will see that it is really slippery and there is minimal friction so that you can understand why the fish really do glide. In the processing plant setting, as, as Jim described, it's about just over 450 feet long. It's attached actually to the ceiling and goes through several different buildings. The fish move the entire distance in about 10 seconds and they're doing it at a rate of about 4,500 fish per shift. And so we've moved you know, well over two million, two and a half million, probably closer to three million fish now with, with no issues whatsoever. So lastly, on our website, just www.woosh.com, there is a, a section under studies and the, the details of all of the different studies and the, uh, from all of the data that I've pulled out from multiples are, are there. And that can be also reached via the uh, Woosh Innovations mobile app. So these are just an image of what that looks like.